But you know, when people are your enemies, Paul tells us to deal with those the same way God dealt with us. We're going to take a look at some verses. When you were born into this world, what was your status with God? Separated. Separated. Okay. Were you enemies with God? Yes. Through wicked works as you develop in, you know, you're born with that genetic code. That was interesting what Richard went through yesterday. I'd like to see more on that. But I do know that you were born with the genetic code of your dad. And guess what you got from your dad? You got a nature that produces wicked works and separates you from God. And guess what? There's consequences to that. If you would, come to 1 Timothy um, chapter 6 and Colossians chapter 1. When I think about forgiveness, we look at the chart. I'm going to do a little bit with the chart. We almost took it down there for a few minutes. I'm glad we left it up. When we deal with forgiveness... 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm sorry, First Tim, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I love those big Bibles. I'm ready. You're ready, good. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 14. Paul's writing Timothy. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what do we normally call that in the body of Christ? What is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to us? The rapture. That's a term out of the Latin Bible, but it's a good term. It has to do with our resurrection. And it's interesting when you're in Acts chapter 1... When the Lord Jesus Christ is going up into heaven, He's standing where? On the Mount of Olives. And the angel says, Why look you steadfast into heaven? The same Jesus that leaves shall in like manner return to where? The Mount of Olives, okay, here on the earth. When you look at our resurrection, First Thessalonians chapter 4, guess where we're going to meet Him? It ain't going to be on the Mount of Olives. It's going to be in the air. It's a different event. So we're looking for that appearing, the appearing, which in his times, it's not singular, it's plural. There is a sequence of events in his times that the Lord Jesus Christ has to reconcile all things unto himself, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. The beginning event for us in those times is that appearing, which in his times he shall show something, who is the blessed and only potentate. You know, the offense we have in our nature that produces sins, that sin nature creates an offense with who? The only potentate. We're not dealing with the neighbor. We're dealing with God himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man can see uh, as seen, nor can see to whom be glory and power and everlasting, amen, come to Colossians. That's in your other Bible. Colossians chapter, chapter 1. Forgiveness. The basis of forgiveness is going to be the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll look at those two verses in just a few moments. But you know something? When you look, I'm already bumping into the chair. Yeah, I probably need to move it. When you look at the sequence of events up here, we know about the separation between God's people and the nations. There's not a lot of detail back here with Babel, the Tower of Babel. We're going to take a look at some of that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, Back in verses 16 through 19, he's talking about the governments of the universe. Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, he's going to reconcile unto himself. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Reconciliation, what is that?
being brought back together. Why do you have to be brought back together? Because you are at enmity with God. We are in offense because of wicked works of our mind. God is here and we are here and between us is our sin. God's going to reconcile that, but notice what else he says. That we're sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Now when you go back up to verse 18, concerning him is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, he might have the preeminence. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the preeminent one in the universe. Everything that God the Father, God the Son, the Holy, and God the Holy Ghost is doing in their universe, guess who the focus is? God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that offense that we are, God has a purpose for himself in that. Is there anything God can't do? Touchdown. What did he say? That's right. Verse. <laughs> Come to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. It's interesting. We have, uh, I work at a nuclear plant. Like I teach guys how to operate the plant. And uh, I'll watch your eyes when they start drifting. We'll, we'll stop. But when it's time to take a break, I look at the clock and I look at, the, uh, look at their faces and I go, okay, let's take a break. One of the guys on the front row sitting about that, that distance from me asked the guy to his left, he said, I got a question for you. He said, what's that? What's this thing about the giants in the Bible? And I heard him say that and I said, are you talking about Genesis chapter 6? And he said, yeah. I said, well, I'll tell you what, when I get off the clock today, because I'm a contractor, I said, if you want to stick, stick, stick around, I'll show you what it is, what happened, why it happened, and God's remedy. He said, okay. From him, he's in grade school of the Bible now, and that was less than six months ago, we have about four guys coming to Starbucks on Saturday morning. So something good can happen to Starbucks, okay? <laughs> Besides my caffeine. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, and hope, of eternal life, which God who what? Cannot lie. Cannot lie. Cannot lie. Well, you know, that's, that, that's in Paul's epistles. Take a look at Hebrews 6. Verse 17. Hebrews 6, 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. Now, who's the book of Hebrews written to? Hebrews. Well, that's a tough one. I like hard questions. Okay. <laughs> Pro, uh, to show unto the heirs of promise the, immit, it, it, a little bit of, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it was, what's that next word? impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation to have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. A couple of things. Between us and God, there's a barrier when we're born into this world. Our nature produces sins. Sins have accountability and that barrier between us and God, God has made a remedy for. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. Start in verse 3 of Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, 
According, according as he hath chosen us when? In him when? Before the foundation of the world, God's eternal purpose in Christ, because I'm in him, his eternal purpose in him, I am part of that eternal purpose that he chose before the foundation of the world. You notice the words to be are not in there. He didn't choose me to be in him, but in him I am chosen for that eternal purpose which he purposed before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath, he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom? In Christ, we have redemption. Redemption is paying the purchase price to buy out of the slave market. We were born into the slave market of sin. The redemptive price was paid. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Colossians 1.4 14, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Verse 12, starting there, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. By the redemption of his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. So the question usually comes up when I deal with people at work, how many? How many sins? All? Just Well, they'll say that, but they'll say, but just the past sins. Come to Colossians chapter 2. Is it just the past sins? The barrier between us and Him has to be removed. And that, that barrier is our sin nature produces sin. So how does he rec uh, fix that? He paid the price. Colossians chapter 2. Starting in verse 9. For in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. One of the men I'm dealing with at work, he's Pentecostal in his background, and he has conditional life. What do I mean by conditional life? Yeah, his forgiveness is conditional. He has it today, but he says, if I sin tomorrow. And I said, you know, you're using the wrong word there. The, the right word is, when you sin this afternoon. <laughs> Don't wait till tomorrow. How is God going to deal with that? Okay? For in Him, in God, in God the Son, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When, when Philip, I think it's John chapter 14, he said, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And he said, well, you've been so long with me. You don't realize if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In the Lord Jesus Christ is the visible demonstration of the Godhead. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality. Didn't we just read that? He's the preeminent one. He's the only potentate. Every time I think of that, I think of the Shriners. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the preeminent one. He is the head of all principality and power. The government of the universe, He's the head. Now, wait a minute. Well, let's finish. Let's go down through the passage. In whom ye also are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Where did that occur? Past time. That's the cross. When he was crucified, guess who else was crucified? This old guy. When he was baptized, buried with him in baptism, Romans 6, 1 through 4, when he was buried in baptism, 
wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, not my operation. God did this. When Christ was resurrected, guess who else was resurrected? I was. I wasn't even born then. Uh, hold your hand there and come back to Romans 4. Hold your hand there and come back to Romans 4. It's interesting when you read something like Isaiah 14. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's speaking through Isaiah, and Isaiah's writing it down, he talks about a future event as if it's already occurred. I saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. Where does that happen? That comes out of Revelation chapter 12 when he's kicked out of heaven. That hadn't happened yet. And then he goes back to the immediate things that are going on on the earth. And then he goes in time before that when Satan was created. So when you're taking uh, a look here at uh, Romans chapter 4, he's dealing with Abraham. And you come down to verse 17. Starts with the parentheses, as, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom ye, ye he believed. Even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they what? Yeah. He's already telling you what's going to happen like it's historical in nature. In chapter 8 of Romans, he talks about he knows in advance who's going to believe. And those that are going to believe, guess what? He calls. How's he call them? 2 Thessalonians 2.14, by the gospel. He calls them. Those he called, guess what? Those he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also what? Glorified. glorified. Who in here looks glorified? You know how God views you and I? He knew in eternity past. He didn't predetermine. He knew in eternity past that I would respond to the gospel. I got the gospel. I believed it. He declared me just before God. Declared me righteous. And guess what? He sees me as though it already has occurred, things which be not as though they were. He had already told Abraham and Sarah they were going to have a child. Did they have one? No. Long time later, when they quit trying to help, by the way. So come back to Colossians chapter, chapter 2. Verse 13. And you being dead in your sins, that's our status when we come into this world. The nature's there, and we build up our sin account. And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, with Christ, having what? Forgiven you, that's plural, all your trespasses. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you, when Christ died 2,000 years ago, all my trespasses were yet future. That debt has been cleared away, and I presently possess the very righteousness of God in my account. Now, how many people in here know me personally? Yeah, yeah, okay. You're laughing back there. That's right. Do I still have my dad's nature? Oh, yeah. Well, you didn't have to say that so quickly. Yeah, I do. Okay. So forgiveness. God has provided forgiveness through us through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he hath forgiven us all trespasses. And when you tell people that, they go, yeah, that's just past. I said, but that's not what it says. It says all. And the ones that I had when he died were all future, therefore. And, and, and I tell them the other thing. I said, you go up to verse, uh, uh, verse 10. If I'm complete, where? In him. What else can I do to add to that? Nothing. Complete forgiveness. There's, there's different words we use, uh, Scripture used, remission of sins. What does that mean? Generally, it means forgiveness of sins. It's the taking away of sins. You see that in Acts chapter 238, when it's talking about an individual Jew entering into the blessing of the nation, 
nationally, they had to have that national sin for them forgiven. But guess what was required for them? Acts 2.38, are they required, they, not us, are they required to be baptized for sin issue? Yeah, come back to Ezekiel 36. We're going to come back to Paul's epistles here in just a few minutes. There is, there is enmity between God and Israel. Between God and Israel, what is Israel's name before he became Israel? Jacob. This time over here, this time of wrath, what's another term for that time of wrath? Jacob's trouble. Who sends him trouble? God does. Why? Well, go to Ezekiel 36 and uh, Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26 first. Years ago, when I was first saved, and uh, I learned about Schofield Wright Division through my former father-in-law, E.C. E. Beard. He also taught me Paul, my apostle, in mid-Acts, which is where we're at. He taught me those things. Anybody ever heard of Art Sims? Art Sims was a teacher of mine for quite a while. Have you ever heard about the circle of fellowship? If I had a whiteboard, I'd show it to you. He said, when you're saved, you enter into fellowship with God. Okay? And you're in that circle. You can't, you can't get out. In the very center is the position of fellowship. The outer circle is eternal life. The inner circle is fellowship. By the way, this is wrong. But when you hear it, understand where it comes from. And he said that when you sin, you stay inside the eternal life circle, but the inner circle, which is fellowship, you go out of. I said, well, how do you fix that? 1 John 1, 9. Has anybody ever heard anybody use 1 John 1, 9? If we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know who 1 John's written to? Israel. It's not written to the body of Christ. What is it talking about when it talks about that? It's talking about forgiveness of sins, isn't it? Look, look at uh, Leviticus 26, ver verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, God does not give you a conditional clause as a saint for blessing. What did Ephesians 1.3 say? You are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are they, na are they physical in nature? No, they're spiritual. Notice what he says in list. We're just going to look at a couple of these. If you obey me, I will bless. Then I will give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield or increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing floor shall uh, reach unto the vintage, and so on. Is any of that spiritual in nature? No. When they obeyed, what did God do? Give them eternal life? He gave them physical blessing. What did they do when they disobeyed? Come down to verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if you abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes, and so on. In each succeeding phase of these five courses, he adds something else onto that, when they're disobedient. Is anything in that spiritual in nature? No, it's all physical. Come down to verse, uh, let's see, verse 33. And I will scatter you in the fifth course among the, the heathen, 
and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lieth desolate, and you will be in your enemy's land. Even then, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. So God has gone through each of these five courses when they disobey. God is going to send curses unto them, ultimately to take them out of the land, disperse them amongst the nations, scatter them. That's why in James it says that the 12 tribes scattered abroad. That's the status of them when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Now, is there a remedy here? Look at verse 40. If they shall do what? Confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespasses which they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant. That's restoration. So what do they got to do? They got to confess. What are they going to confess? Come to Ezekiel 36. And then we'll go to Daniel 9. And why bring it up if it's not the body of Christ? Well, when people take you to 1 John 1 9, you need to know what 1 John 1 9 is talking about. It's talking about Leviticus 26, Ezekiel 36, and I want you to see how Daniel deals with it in Daniel chapter 9. Ezekiel 36, we'll break into the passage at verse, um, verse 24. Uh, four. One of the preachers talked about this this morning. The United Nations didn't, isn't putting Israel in the land here. This is God doing it. It's interesting. My wife being Soviet, growing up, she said, you know who was instrumental in getting most of the Jews in the Middle East? I've never verified. Joseph Stalin. I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't get that in history class. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Well, didn't we read over Leviticus 26? He scattered them out to these all these nations. He's going to bring them back. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? So what's the purpose of water baptism? It's a cleansing. For who? The individual Jew, so he can have eternal life? No. How does an individual Jew get it? How did Adam and Eve get eternal life? The shed blood of the innocent animal that God covered them with, God accepted for their sin. He saw that in that, their faith in that, the cross. Now, he didn't tell them about the cross, not in detail, but in Genesis chapter 3, he gave them the remedy. I will put enmity between thy seed and the serpent and between his seed and your seed, the woman's seed. What's he going to do? He's going to fix it. So what did she say when Cain was born? I have a man from God. She figured that was him, and it wasn't. When God did that, in Dan and we're reading in Daniel, uh, we'll read in Daniel in just a minute. God's provision for them was the shed blood of the innocent for the guilty. How about under the law? Did people get eternal life by obeying the law? Okay, we'll look at those in just a minute. In, uh, Romans chapter 3 and 4, and that's probably where I'll close. Daniel chapter 9. But in Ezekiel 36, you're going to be cleansed from what? All your iniquity and all your idolatry. And now I'm going to take you and I'm going to put my law within your hearts and I'm going to cause you to do what the law demanded. Is there any place in Scripture we see that beginning to happen? Anybody? Acts chapter 2. You tell me anybody that would sell everything they got 
have and lay it at the apostles' feet and share it amongst people that didn't earn it. That is not natural. Daniel chapter 9. Remember in Leviticus 26, when God sends them chastisement, it comes in dis distinctive courses, and that he has a remedy. Well, Daniel goes in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ab Azarias, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Well, the 70 years are up. There's no sense before the 70 years doing anything because you have to go through the full chastisement. So he looks, the 70 years are up, verse 3, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Well, that's not telling me a whole lot until you get to verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and did what? Made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God keepeth the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned. Ezekiel 36. Leviticus 26. So when you're in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, there is a remedy for an individual Jew to enter into the covenant blessing that God had for Israel when they get restored, when they looked at salvation, they looked at five distinct pieces of it. The one we talk about is redemption. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Guess who else had redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins? The Israel of God. That's exactly right. The individual Jew to enter into the blessing of the covenant had prerequisites because the covenant is not just this spiritual issue of redemption. Guess what else it is? It's a physical provision. He's going to deliver them from their enemies. He's going to avenge the enemies, destroy them. He's going to set himself up as king over the kingdom and bless them. And then guess what Israel will be? We won't turn to Exodus 19. But he said, if you'll obey my voice indeed, you shall be a peculiar people. I will make you a kingdom of priests. You know what a priest is? That's the go-between between God and man. Well, if they're a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, who are they a go-between? God and the heathen, the nations. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, they fulfill that, that promise the commission to go into all the nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever the Lord Jesus Christ had commanded them, and that's taking place out there. So they are in a status right here when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, they are ripe for wrath. It doesn't come, but they have a way to get out of that wrath, and what is it? Daniel describes it in Daniel chapter 9. It's that cleansing that John the Baptist came. He said come, they came confessing their sins. What sins? The ones of Ezekiel 36. Individually, it's redemption through his blood by grace through faith alone. National blessing has works involved with it in order to get that restoration and to get restored to their kingdom glory. So when you come over, and that's dealing with the breach between Israel and God, the enmity that's there when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. He comes to his own. He comes to Israel. There's an en enmity back here that begins at the Tower of Babel. At the Tower of Babel. Um, come to Genesis chapter 9. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 11. The 
The first two uses of the word imagine and imagination are in Genesis chapter 6 and, Ge and Genesis chapter 9, uh, 11, 11. In Genesis chapter 6, it says the imaginations of their heart was only evil continually. Guess what happens when they, right after that? Anybody? Blood. It destroys them off the face of the earth. The imagination of man is not a good thing. Genesis chapter 11. Uh, beginning in verse... Um, Verse 5, Genesis 11, 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have, what's that next word? Imagine to do. Come to uh, Romans 1. All of mankind sitting right here had light. They did something with that light using their vain imaginations. And there is a consequence. God gives them exactly what they want. You ever done that with your kids? How's that working for you? <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Where we're at here historically, this is a commentary on Genesis chapter 11. Romans 1 is. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they're all of one language, they're of one blood, and they are doing what they're doing so they don't get scattered upon the earth. So when God confuses their tongues, guess what happens? They get scattered. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's some other things I think happen at the same time. In Genesis chapter 10, there's a man named Peleg. His name means shaken to pieces. The Peleg, for in his days, was the earth divided. Probably physical changes in the earth that put physical separation. But notice what it says in Romans chapter 1. Because that when they knew God, they, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools they cha and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Where God, wherefore God also did what? gave them up to their own imaginations. He no longer restrained. He no longer intervened. From this time forward, he no longer intervenes. There is enmity between God and man, the Gentile nations. Guess who is one of those guys? Abram. He's one of the heathen. They're all in this status according to Genesis 11. God goes down and reaches unto Abram and he says, here's what I want you to do. Abram responds positively, and there we have the enmity between the uncircumcision and the circumcision of God. That enmity is put in place to protect the seed line through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out here to the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, they are to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and when you're out here during the kingdom, guess who's going to be evangelizing the heathen nations? It's going to be Israel. But right now, their status is what? They have fallen. They have fallen to what status? Down to where the heathen nations are. They're considered as uncircumcised and hard and ear in Acts chapter 7. They are considered just like you and I were when we were brought into this world as heathen. What makes the difference between them and us now? If you come over to Romans chapter 3. Paul deals in Romans 1. 
with that event and the status of the nations all the way out to the Apostle Paul. Ephesians 2.11 says that we were 2.11 through 12 that the status of the nations are they were strangers from the covenants of promise through Israel and without hope and without God in the world. But now God has done, He's made them reconciled unto the world. He reconciled the world unto Himself. Um, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. He takes the, the heathen, the religious heathen in chapter the first part of chapter 2, the Jew in cha- the remaining part of chapter 2, Chapter 3, verse 1, he could say he's already concluded there is no advantage of being a Jew except for, in chapter 1, what advantage then hath the Jew? He says, much every way for was committed unto them the oracles of God. So when he gets to Romans chapter 3, verse 19, we're going to see that now God has something in the forgiveness, redemption area that is no longer distinguished by whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In chapter 4, he's going to talk about Abram before the law. He wasn't justified by works. He wasn't justified by the doing of righteousnesses. He was justified by faith. David, under the law, we'll look at in just a second, the same thing. His sins were dealt with not because he kept the law, but God imputed righteousness to his account the same way he did to you and I. But though he did not explain all that, come down, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God without the law was not manifested to them the way it is now to us. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all. His provision is for everybody without distinction. Not Israel first to everyone without distinction, unto all, but who gets it? Only on those that trust exclusively in what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. Why do I add all those other words in other than belief? If you have six people and you ask them what belief means, you'll probably get six different answers. So when I'm trusting something like this stage, which I'm not too sure about, and I keep bumping into the chair, if I trust that, then I have a confidence in it, whether it's a false confidence or not. But when I trust in His righteousness, is it bouncing? (laughs) Okay. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. The provision is for every son of Adam that's on the planet today. Jew, Muslim, anybody. And it's only upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being declared righteous freely. Justified is to be declared by God that I have met His standard because He has given me His righteousness. I'm not standing in mine own. Freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a fully satisfying sacrifice, propitiation, that fully satisfied the justice of God at Calvary. Through faith in His blood to declare the righteousness, His righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. When was God dealing with sin in a forbearance fashion? Anybody? Old Testament. From the time of Adam and Eve, Cain, if he'd have done it, Abel did do it, 
all the way up. You come at the other side of the flood in Genesis chapter 9. That's why I was going there. What did Noah do? He built an altar. What do you do on an altar? You sacrifice and shed blood. As you continue up, even before you get to Abram, God has a provision. It's the shed blood. But how many times did they have to shed blood? Over and over. Every time they sin. I always like Job chapter 1. Job does a sacrifice in case his boys had sinned. He figured his girls hadn't done it. <laughs> but he knew boys. But what's he do? He sacrifices. He sheds blood. God didn't give them righteousness because they were righteous. They're just like you and I are. They're sinners. God's provision has always been by the shed blood of the innocent for the guilty. Through the forbearance of God. Well, he couldn't take away sin, Hebrews 9, 10, 11 tell you back here. Why? 9 and 10. It's not possible that the blood of good bulls and goats could take away sin. But he saw that, like we read in Romans 4, he calleth those things which be not as though they were. In the time of his forbearance, those sins are now remitted, taken away from him. On the basis of what? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sins through the shedding of his blood. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness at this time. They didn't have all this understanding. That he might be just. God can't give you eternal life just because he loves you. Ephesians 4.32, he says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So how did God forgive me? He was kind. He was tenderhearted. That's the demonstration of the cross. God the Father forgave me for Jesus' sake. In Colossians chapter 2, stay there in Romans. In Colossians chapter 2, uh, no, chapter 3, I'm sorry. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. In Ephesians 4.32, God the Father, kind, tenderhearted toward us, forgave us for Jesus' sake. And here, the Lord Jesus Christ forgave us also. Okay? Back to uh, chapter 3. To declare, I say at this time, verse 26... His righteousness. He, Paul's a two, due time testifier. He's declaring some things that the Old Testament did not clearly tell. Why? Well, he was the one that gave, he fulfilled, completed the word of God, the capstone of revelation. That I, he might be just. He can't just give you eternal life because God so loved the world. His justice has to be satisfied. And it was satisfied in only one location. Calvary. And the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He can declare you right. Because of faith. There is no merit in faith. The merit is in who you are trusting in. The confidence in that cross is what gives an individual. And that cross alone provides eternal life. There's, there's kind of, a, to me, an interesting comment in Acts chapter 15 when he talks about at this time. Anybody know what's going on in Acts chapter 15? Yeah, there, there's Bible conference, kind of. We got, we got people from Jerusalem telling everybody they've got to be circumcised. When I get to glory, one of the first people I want to meet is Titus. Because they weren't going to circumcise Titus. <laughs> no, you're not touching me. <laughs> so Paul took him up to Jerusalem as the test case. He's a Gentile. And when he goes up to Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 15, the commentary on that's in Galatians 2. He went up by revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ said, it's time, go talk to him. 
and he communicated to them the gospel which he preached. Well, A, if it's not different, why did he have to communicate anything? But it was different. And there's a comment that Peter makes, and uh, to me it's kind of interesting. In Acts chapter 15, verse 7, And when there had been much uh, disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, You know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth. That's a household of Cornelius. That was, uh, anybody ever watch Andy Griffith? Shazam moment? You know, because here's Peter. He's up there getting ready. God sent me here. I don't really know what to do with these guys. And he begins to convey that Jesus is the Christ. Now, if you read Acts chapter 2, what's the, one of the prerequisites you've got to have before you get the Holy Spirit? Water. You can't get it without it. And then there are signs following when you do it. So, here's Cornelius. He's before Peter, and Peter's preaching to him. And while he was yet speaking, guess what happened? He got the Holy Spirit with signs and wonders, and he goes... Okay, guys, what doth hinder that we should <laughs> hinder us that we should baptize these guys? He didn't know what was going on. He knew that the signs demonstrated God was doing something in the household of Cornelius. God already told me he was going to do that. And when that happened, what does he expect he's got to do now? Well, their commission is what? Water baptism is the cleansing to enter in that covenant relationship. And here's a bunch of Gentiles got it without any water. So when when Peter's given the defense, his position, he's talking, he's already talked to Paul, Peter, James, and John have. James the Lord's brother, not the apostle. So in Acts chapter 7, I'm sorry, 15, verse 7, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did, did unto us. That is not prophecy. He didn't understand what was going on. But guess what he's understanding while they're having this conference? Paul's communicating his gospel to them. Now it's starting to click. And he goes and put no difference between us and them. Does God have a difference when the apostles are preaching in the book of Acts. Yes. They go on to none but unto the Jews only. God's provision for the blessing for the planet and salvation of the heathen is through Israel. God put no difference. <laughs> Between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Verse 11. For we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. You notice he says that in the future tense? How's a Jew reckon salvation? He doesn't have salvation until he enters into that kingdom and all five of those things have occurred and they're in blessing. He's not just talking about redemption when it's a Jew. We get everything the moment we trust the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because everything that is ours is spiritual. We possess it now. He says, we're going to get it. You know how we're going to get it? Same way they did. (laughs) I said, wow, I had never thought about that. So the revelation to him, I also find kind of interesting because right after this, where does Paul go? This is my speculation. This isn't genetic. This is my speculation. Paul goes to Antioch. Guess who follows him to Antioch? Peter. And Peter's there, and he's doing what with the Gentiles? He's eating. I think he had ham and eggs, to be honest with you, and then fried shrimp. Because it wasn't just sitting down with the Gentiles that was the problem. He was eating with them. And they didn't have clean and unclean. They had food. Okay? So... Forgiveness. Forgiveness has always been justification unto life. 
The clearing of that enmity between us and God has always been by grace through faith alone in the shed blood of the innocent to the guilty. We now know more about that today than Adam knew, I think. He might have known more than we give him credit for. Knew more than We know more than Noah. We know more than Abram. We know the conclusion of God's redemptive plan for the universe in Paul's epistles. We also know that what he has done for us during that time of forbearance, he did for them. He did for them. Now, the provision for their kingdom, yes, there's an obedience, there's physical things they got to do in order to enter in. We don't have a kingdom that's physical, it's spiritual in nature. You know what kind of body you're going to have? A spiritual body. Yeah, I don't know what that's like, but I do know the Lord Jesus Christ could go through walls and he was still eating. And I don't think he was getting fat like I am. <laughs> okay. What God did in Christ was reconcile the world. Back here, he rejected the world. He gave them up to their own imaginations. When Israel was set aside, they, they, they stumbled at the cross. They fell at the stoning of Stephen. And there's three distinct proclamations in Paul's epistles where he gave them up. He went to the Gentiles. When that's over, what's the status of Israel today? They're heathen. What's the status of us today? Not saints, Gentiles. Heathen. When you read Romans 11, he had, well, let me just read it because my memory won't serve me right. Romans 11. Eleven twenty six. Actually, it started in verse 25. For I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that you should, I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We are living not in the times of the Gentiles, but the fullness of the Gentiles. Guess where God's life is present on planet Earth? It's in the Gentiles. And even when a Jew gets saved, guess what he's considered? Heathen. There is no difference today. There's no advantage. A Jew can rebuild the temple, go in there and offer blood sacrifices. There's not going to be a Shekinah glory in the Holy of Holies, and it's not going to do him any good. And so all Israel shall be saved. You notice how Peter said that? And we shall be saved even as they... As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. I said he's going to be the Deliverer, the Avenger, the King, and the Blesser. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He's concluding the three chapters where Israel is still going to get what God promised them, but not the Israel today. For as ye in times past, there's our dividing line, have not believed God, but yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, for as in, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they may also may obtain mercy, for God hath concluded them all, all, in unbelief. Why? The purpose, the intent, is that he might have mercy upon all without a difference. That's part of the mystery. When, that, when they rejected Christ, rejected Stephen, the next thing on God's prophetic calendar was this folded up, and wrath. But instead of wrath, God used that to do something He promised before the foundation of the world, kept it a mystery, and we have that ministry today to both Gentiles and Jews because they're all concluded in unbelief. They're all concluded as the heathen. 
We didn't move up to their status. They moved down to our status. Okay. Forgiven. So out here in 1 John 1, 9, when people want to use that verse, I'll tell you that's what you got to do when you sin. You know what I got to do when I sin? I got to reckon myself in, 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 indeed dead unto sin. I got to stop it. Don't have to confess it. It's already been dealt with. He has forgiven me all trespasses. I am complete in him. Nothing changes that status. Not even me. We're out of time. Do you have any questions? Is everybody still awake? Nobody's head hit the table, so I'm, I'm, that's a success. Okay. Comments? Anybody? Father, we thank you for the time together and the fellowship around your word. Use us in these bodies for your honor and your glory. For Jesus' sake, amen.